Hi, uh, thank you and welcome uh, to my talk, Designing for Ownership, another refactoring story. So, I'm Stefan. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm one of the organizers of Rust Linz. Anybody knows Rust Linz? Hey, cool. Fantastic. And uh, I'm also the author of Shuttle Launchpad. Anybody know Shuttle Launchpad? A newsletter that brings you Rust tutorials? Okay, a few. Should be more. It's a great newsletter, I think. So, um, and I like to talk about refactoring, and I like to talk about refactoring a lot because that's what I do. Uh, and I do this because software evolves, you know. There's not a single piece of software that is perfect from day one. And I'd even argue that there is no software that will ever be perfect. It's just in a state where it's either good enough for what we want to achieve right now, or it's in need of refactoring so we can be prepared for the future things to come. Um, and this can leave software in a state that might not be the most aesthetic, uh, but at least it works as intended, like this beautiful building in Innsbruck that has been shot by my friend uh, Bernhard Meyer. Uh, and it undoubtedly has, has seen some different phases in its existence, and the longer you look at it, the more things you realize, what's, what's, actually, what's actually going on with, with the windows up there, and why is the little little plant outside, where does this come from? So, you know, the, more you long, uh, the, the longer you look at it, the more questions arise. And the same thing can happen with Rust code. So, um, I think Rust is a perfect prototyping language, and I'm not the only one who thinks so. So, this is a, a post from Reddit from just a week ago, uh, where the author writes that Rust lets you comfortably leave perfection for later. And they say that you can write Rust pretty much as fast as you can write code in any other programming language, but with a small detail, um, with a meaningful difference, with a little discipline, it's easy to make the rough edges obvious, so you can sort them out later, like error handling, concurrency, unit testing, and this is something that I have seen myself and also the people I work with have seen for themselves. Little disclaimer up front, now we go into the examples, and they are fictional but rooted in reality, and if my colleagues from Dynatrace are here, they say, yeah, sure, fictional, but, <laughs> but more on that later. So, um, who has been to Eurorust last year? Okay, quite a few. So, don't worry if you've seen this image already. Uh, it's the same image as last year, but this won't be the same talk. It will be the sequel. And for everybody who hasn't been to Rustlins, previously at Eurorust, the project I was working on is a serverless platform. So we've written a serverless platform that allows you to execute JavaScript workloads. First of all, cool. It's pretty cool that uh, some person like me is able to do that with no background in systems engineering, whatever, and that's due to the power of Rust. Um, and it has two modes. Mode number one is just send over an ad hoc workload, which means that you have the JavaScript as it is. Um, it will be received and will be sent to the execution engine, to the worker, and you produce a result. Um, the other mode is the application mode, and the application mode means that you load a file from disk and execute that in the serverless platform. So you have two modes, an event source that tells you it's either mode 1 or mode B, mode ad hoc, mode application, and then you execute the worker. Um, and the original function um, that did all the configuration extraction, chose the mode and whatever, looked kind of like this. So. Um, this was a project that undoubtedly grew over time. It was overwhelming. That was the original state of the function, and it was a huge, big mess, a huge, big pile of code that was hard to maintain, hard to read, and very hard to understand. So it was hard to maneuver around. Um, and last time, we applied some Rust-specific refactorings to it. So first, we defined error boundaries so that we can just bubble up errors, that we have proper error propagation. Um, we can develop on the happy path. This is always quite nice. You can just develop like there would be no errors because you bubble up everything. And we also introduced custom types that abstract the application semantics. We applied default and conversion traits that communicate intent. And we defined custom traits to prepare for different implementations. So those are basically um, four very Rust specific refactoring techniques. What we also did is that we applied one of the original gang of four design patterns to it. We pushed the flow of execution to an executor, and we were swapping out the strategy based on the mode we were in, like ad hoc or application. So you have this trait event strategy, you have two structs implementing event strategy, and you can swap out one for the other. And this is what we ended up with, this beautiful piece of code that you can easily read, easily understand, and know what's going on. First, we extract some config from the event that we're getting in. We're having an event source, an event comes in, we extract everything we need to make the worker run. That's the config extraction. 
then based on the mode, we define our strategy. And here we use a trade object because, you know, we just easily want to swap it out like polymorphism style, like you would do in any OO language. Oh, oh. Um, and last but not least, we execute or evaluate. There's another parameter called path, if it's health. So this is a detail that you need, don't need to worry about. But what you need to know is that you either evaluate your code, like does it compile, does it, is it even possible to execute it, or you go directly into executed mode. Those were the two modes that we provided uh, on top of it. And you know, it's, it's good, it's fantastic. We, we know what's going on, we can read. Um, um, the, 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 the flow of execution. We know that we are dealing with a config, with an event strategy. We have two different modes. So all of that becomes visible in those uh, few lines of code. And if I come to the project with no background in the project, I, you know, I, I, I can read some of the semantics of the software out of it instead of you know, just dealing with strings and unwraps and whatnot. But something is off. And honestly, this has bugged me now for a year. So ever since I've showed the refactorings there at Eurorust last year, I thought, damn, something bugs me and I can't figure out what. And what it was actually was that my software only worked if I wrapped my event in reference counters or RCs. Anybody in here who doesn't know what an RC is? Okay, one or two, yeah, a couple. So for those who don't know what an RC is, it's basically a struct that you can own, it's a smart pointer that allows you to refer to the same data but in a value that you can own at some other place. Um, if you clone a reference counter, you create another reference to the data, the reference counter goes up, if you drop the clone, it goes down again, and when it's at zero, it just frees the memory. So this is the rough idea of a reference counter, like a very manual way of doing garbage collection. Um, and we need that at this place because we extract the path name right after we move the event to one of those strategies. And this is also what the compiler tells us. If we remove the RC, we get one of those, those errors that you all got, you know, well, it, it, it's borrowed here, but it has been moved somewhere else, so please do something around that. You don't move values that you later need. Um, and so, yeah, this is why we introduced the RC, but I wonder, why do we need to have owned values to begin with? Why does the strategy need to own the event? Um, it's a single flow of execution. There are no cross-references to this event structure anywhere, so the low line actually needs to modify or change the event data. They only read from it. So shouldn't the normal reference be sufficient? Um, so let's try it. This is the app strategy, the constructor. It's not, not the details, not the implementation of the event strategy, but the app strategy, and we change the RC of a handler event to a reference. So we need to add some lifetimes, that's what you need to do if you want to have a struct um, with a reference in it, no biggie. And we do the same thing for the other strategy as well. And once we do that, we are getting this error message. Um, we pass the references instead of the RCs, and we see that the compiler tells us that the cast requires that the event is bored for tick static lifetime. Huh. Anybody has seen this error message? Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, this is beautiful, almost on the south of it. So this bugged me so much. This was one of the situations where I argued with the borrow checker for a very long time to figure out what is actually going. Because what confused me most that on line 50, where the event has been dropped, this was actually the end of my program. So there was nothing going on afterwards. This was the end of the main function. I couldn't figure out why I needed a tick static lifetime. For that. So the first thing that I do, okay, if it tells me that it needs a tick static lifetime, I try to swap it out for a tick static lifetime, didn't work, so I only get the same error. Um, but in the end, what the problem was, was the executor, a totally different part of my software, and the compiler didn't tell me anything about it. So the problem was that the executor holds a box to a trade object, and the trade object in turn contains a reference to this event data. Um, and, and this little situation here, um, brought me into a situation where, or my program into a situation where the borrowed value inside the strategy had to live longer than it was available. So this was the problem. But the compiler didn't tell me. So this was just by accident that I figured out what was going on there and removing the box to a, date, uh, to a trade object to a reference to a trade object with another lifetime sorted everything out. So it works now again, fantastic, everything should Everything compiles, everything works again. I don't need to have my RCs anymore. And you know, with having smart pointers like RCs and boxes, I just can call SREF and then I'm getting the reference to it. So it was pretty easy to get this kind of refactoring. But yeah, the project compiles again. 
we got rid of a smart pointer that we potentially didn't need. But I don't know, something is very off, isn't it? So if I need to modify the ownership semantics of one part of my struct, why do I need to modify the ownership semantics of some entirely different part of my software? Even if those structs are in some relationship, shouldn't they be able to define the ownership semantics independently? So I think so. Um, and if I need to go through the entire call graph of my entities, uh, when I make changes, I get reminded about the dark ages when I have written OO software uh, back, back in the day ages ago. So congratulations. I rediscovered Java, and I don't want it. So let's talk about pointers. Um, this one was outside the university where I studied and now teach. Uh, it's a one-way sign. They ran out of left-pointing one-way signs. So they used the right-way pointing one-way sign. And I don't know if you realize it, so this, they thought this might be confusing. So they put a little documentation down there to, <laughs> to understand how to use it. <laughs> There's a message hidden in there, I guess. So um, if I look at the diagram of my entities, so this is the one thing that we started out with. It's an executor. Um, it needs an event strategy, which can be either ad hoc strategy or application strategy, um, and both need to point to an event. This is where they get their data from. That's OK. The app strategy also needs some other application state. This is uh, information where the files are that it wants to load. No biggie. That's OK. Um, so it doesn't look too bad. But there's something more. The executor also needs the worker, where it actually executes the workload. Um, and it gets past the configuration, another type of data that you know instructs the worker what is going on. Um, and the worker also has a pointer to the configuration. And the configuration is created through data from the event. So you have this big mess of pointers all pointing to the same data structure, all pointing anywhere. There's one pointer that I forgot, which is the application who owns event as well or wants to point to event. So what you get here is a huge complexity for what should be a very simple flow of execution. And if you know this quote by Joe Armstrong, the creator of Erlang, you wanted a banana, but what you get is a gorilla holding a banana in the entire jungle. So if you ever wanted what Joe Armstrong was meaning with that quote, it's one of these diagrams that you just saw. It's just like that. You get all this complexity because everything is pointing around to entities and you don't know why. Um, and the, thing, the cool thing is about Rust that it allows you to model everything um, just like in those programming languages. So it's, it's possible to create relationships like that. And sometimes you need them. That's OK. That's good. But Rust won't allow you to cut any corners. You need to introduce the right data type, the right smart pointer, if you want to model such a relationship, like a box to a trade object or an RC pointing to a reference that is also used somewhere else. Um, but what I think, if we look at the original function, which was huge and a mess, um, it at least got the ownership semantics right. I didn't need to model anything complex because it was just one event going through 150 lines of code. Um, so I think that that is even a downgrade to before where we had this huge mess that nobody could understand. And I wonder, was our refactoring bad or even unnecessary? And I still have questions about that image, so I really, <laughs> really want to know what's going on there. So I think no. I think it was not unnecessary because there's still a couple of results that we got out of it. What we got out of it that undoubtedly, even if there's a huge dependency graph on lots of entities, the code became easier to maintain because you had lots of small points where you could go into, change something, add something, and modify something. And we reduced the mental overhead if you look at the main function to see what's going on. Creating config, defining a strategy, executing it. Or if you want to look into the a strategy, see what it provides so that you know, look at the trade, understand what the strategy is supposed to do, or look at the executor, see what the execution flow is, which is just fine flights of code. So it became easier to maintain and reduce the mental overhead. And we emphasized the semantics of our application through introduction of our own types and traits, which didn't exist before. So this is good. We now have nouns that we can discuss about. So this is great. But most importantly, I think, is that the data flow became visible. First, it was hidden in this huge mess of nested ifs and nested match statements. But now we know exactly what the data flow is. And let's chew on the thing of data flow for a while. Data flow. This is the one thing that I see every time somebody has troubles with relationships between the structs and the borrow check and whatnot. Somebody is giving them the following, following advice. Design your app based on the flow of data. 
And every time I hear this advice, I'm like, yeah, sure, of course, flow of data. What's that supposed to mean? So um, it's such an easy thing to say, but how can you design software like that, especially when your APIs and your structs and everything you have are designed in a different way and you need to work with them? Um, so I always thought, yeah, it's, it's good advice, but it's also kind of esoteric if you don't have anything actual to, to chew on, anything, anything graspable that you can take a reference to, that you can learn, that you can understand. Um, until I found something. Um, I found the work by uh, J. Paul Morrison. Anybody has heard about him? One person. Okay, cool. Yeah, this is what I thought, because I don't know if, if he ever got recognition for his work, but he was designing um, flow-based programming in the 70s and was promoting it heavily during the hate of OO in the 90s. Um, um, he, I guess he worked together with Peter Noir, who works a lot in, in type theory. Um, and some of, of his texts still exist uh, on his GitHub page. So um, I, I think he has passed away last year, uh, but his content is still there. Um, and this is where I found some actual advice. So he says that if you have a sequence diagram, and I guess all of you did one of those sequence diagrams where you have the entities and the messages to send around through, I don't know, a, a very complex flow, um, take this diagram and try to untangle it. Try to look at the data they sent between those entities put the data up front, and then send it through the processes of those entities. And this is how you get from an OO sequence diagram into something like a flow diagram, where you can then decide on, um, on how you want to model your application after. So there's, there's it, it uses the same terms, it uses the same entities, but it, it tries to put the data up front instead of sending messages around, around those entities. Um, and there's some actual advice in there on how to do that. So he goes through an example. And this is, you know, I'm, I always like if I have an example rather than an abstract concept. So, yeah, we can do that for our problem. We can untangle it by looking at the data and sending it through some, some processes, except that we don't need to, because it has been there already from the very beginning. This would have been the flow diagram that we ended up with, the original diagram of the architecture that I showed you up front. We have an event source, it goes to two different modes, and then we send something to the worker. That's a flow diagram. It's right there. It has been there since the very beginning. But we can go a little bit into detail. So the data actually is not just an event source. We have the event information. Yes, you know, we extract a config out of that. We extract some code, payloads, whatever. But the data we consume is the event, but also the mode. You know, the application mode or ad hoc mode. We have one in I'm telling us in which mode we are. That's good. We can combine that into a workload, you know, where we prepare the information that we need into something that we can actually use. Um, and we can send this workload into either the evaluation mode or the execution mode. You know, one thing of those two that we want to do. And based on where we are, evaluation or execution, we then run it through the ad hoc strategy or through the app strategy. One thing that is good about it is that all those strategies yield the same type uh, of return value. So no matter where we go into our flow, we get one type of return value that we then can send back from our function. So let's do that. So instead of having you know, a config and an event and something there and something over there, we just have one workload. It contains the mode, it contains a config, it contains the path to the function, it contains the code, it contains the payload that the function will be called with. Um, and we use the try from trade to yeah, create this workload from all the data that we have, which is a handle event and a mode, and I can also add the app state to it. I just removed it for complexity's sake. And I love that this is the try from trade and not something else, because it's an early failover, you know? This can go wrong. If something goes wrong here in extracting the right data for our modes, we see it here, and then we can do, um, then we can do some error handling. Then we can propagate the error early enough by, getting, by, by just trying to get a sense out of our data. Then we refactor the strategies. We adapt them and look at that, they're now pretty much the same. So they just contain a reference to the workload. That's all they do. They don't want to own that. They just want to provide extra semantic based on the mode. This is basically cost-free. You have all the methods there uh, from, the, from the implementation, but what they own is just you know, a pointer to the workload where they get all the information out of it. Um, the executor now has only two properties. It owns the workload, but it also has a reference to the worker. That's great. Um, and if you look at that, we made two very conscious decisions on own versus borrowed. The executor wants ownership of the workload, as the workload is considered to be done after the execution. That's great. So when the 
execute the drops, the worker drops as well. It doesn't want to own worker, maybe it can't even own worker, but it doesn't matter because it's just sending execution calls to the worker. That's for the executor. On the other hand, the strategy doesn't want to have ownership at all. It just wants to provide a couple of methods on top of worker to understand what's going on. That's all it needs. That's basically cost free. So we end up with two methods now, like an evaluate method and an execute method, that, um, that see which mode they're in and decide on one of those strategies, just like in our flow diagram. If we are in app mode, we call the app strategy. Uh, if we are in ad hoc mode, we call the ad hoc strategy, all with different functions. One is evaluate, the other one is execute. This is what we're going to see here. The original data flow method, the execute method, is now also refactored. It took um, a trade object before, now it can have a generic, you know, now we can monomorphize it. Now we say, okay, I want to get one parameter, that's the strategy. It needs to be of type event strategy, so it has this generic constraint. And then we just execute everything by pulling out the right things from the strategy. That's all we do. So it, um, it's the same execution flow as before, but it became a little bit easier to understand but because we don't need to pass a trade object in. We just can do it for any event strategy that we get. So fantastic. So all those things are still in place. They are slightly adapted by putting the data up front. There's still one problem, though which is our original problem, <laughs> which is that, yeah, you know, I'm passing the event there, it gets owned, so it gets modified, it drops, but I still need it later on to define the mode. Um, and, you know, we can move things around, maybe just extract the path before we create the workload. That's something that we can do, but I think there's a better way. We could make the execution way, if we're going into evaluation mode or execution mode, part of our workload. So we create another enum, either we are in evaluation or execution, and the at the place where we create this workload, we have another line where we say, okay, if the path is self, then execution is evaluation, otherwise it's execute another, another piece of data in our workload struct. Um, and then instead of doing that outside, we create another run method with the executor, where we, based on the execution type, we either evaluate or we execute. That's what we do here. And I've hidden one one ownership speci specific thing in there. I don't know if you can see it. Um, I decided to let run consume the executor. It doesn't take a reference, it does take executor as an owned value. Meaning that after calling run, the executor is gone. The workload is gone. We want a one time execution, and we can do that using ownership semantics. After that, you can't call the executor again. It's just a one-time execution. And I think this is great. So honestly, this, those are the things that I love about, about Rust and about ownership to say, yeah, just this one time and not more. And the execution itself becomes also clearer than before. We create the workload, we create an executor, and we run it. This is everything that we know, but that we need to know. Then we can dig into the executor, into the workload creation, and understand what's going on. A little bootstrap code to get it done. Okay, I hear, I hear um, lunch already being prepared outside, so let's close it up. Um, first of all, we learned a couple of things when we want to design for ownership, having a data object up front that we send through a flow of executions. Owning a value should be very intentional, and I think data structs should be able to decide what to own and how to own it. So if I'm having some data, like a workload, it should be able to um, decide for itself, should it be an ARC, an RC, a boxed value, what not. It shouldn't matter for the rest of the application, just for the one data structure that you own. Smart pointers can always produce references, which means that you can also design your APIs to consume references, if that's the only thing that they need. Um, and ownership also communicates intent. We had a strategy which only took references, which was just there to housekeep. It was just there to maintain existing data and provide extra semantics on top of it. On the other hand, we had the executor, which said, okay, I want to own the workload and I want to be gone after the execution. So the ownership told us that this is going to happen by just looking at the parameter self or at the property of the executor. The results we got, we are prepared for future things. The executor is open to accept workers from an ARC, an RC, a box or whatnot. The executor won't be called more than once. Um, and strategies just extract information from workloads without any extra allocation, other, you know, if, if, if the method requires it. And the good thing is, all our refactorings from last time are still in place. They have not gone away. We still ended up with the same structures. We just put it in a different context, in the context that it was supposed to be. So in the end, 
I think we made the final step in our refactoring, making sure that everything we, we designed is not merely taped together, but rather intentionally owned, referred, or passed around. Reducing pointers in relationship, making sure that the data follows the flow and not the other way around. And yeah, that's it. Is it perfect? I don't know. I will tell you next year <laughs> if we find something else that bugs me. But in the end, I think we made a pretty good result. And with that, I want to say thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch, and thanks for having me.